Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to Holy Trinity on this, the 12th Sunday after Trinity. Um, I just realised why I don't wear, why I wear glasses when I'm doing these things. I'm sorry, it's quite uh, reflective and shiny, but I am behind them, I assure you. None of us this week can have missed the heartbreaking scenes that are going on in Afghanistan at the moment and the sense of despair and loss for many people, including many of those who are in the armed forces and fought there, uh, is very palpable. Britain and America and others rightly feel that they have a duty of care and a certain sense of responsibility for what's happened, but most of us feel completely helpless in knowing what to do. I don't have any insight or answers to that more than anyone else, but I do know one thing. My faith teaches me one thing, which is as believers in the God who makes all things well and as followers of the way, we do not have a right as Christians to just feel sad and leave it there. We may not know what we can do, but that can't be our final thought to just throw our hands in despair and sorrow and say, well, what can you do? We need to keep asking God for wisdom. We keep, need to keep asking God to find ways that we can make people's lives better. The words of Isaiah teach us, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. It is by these that the Father knows you love him. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts 
by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God is love, and we are God's children. There is no room for fear in love. We love because God loved us first. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Almighty God, we confess to you and to our fellow members in the body of Christ that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry. Forgive us our sins and deliver us from the power of evil. For the sake of your Son who died for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. God who is both power and love, forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by your Spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to God on high. of Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. 
The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The Lord of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell, live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favour and honour. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching at the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult, who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, the flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones who did not believe, and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God.
May the words of my lips and the meditation in my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In a way, this is a bit more uh, an address than a sermon, uh, because as you can imagine, I've been having to do a great deal of thinking about how we can go back into church, and in particular, thinking about what our worship is going to look like, because things are different. There will, at least initially, be few of us. Some have passed away, some have grown frailer, and some are still wary of the virus, so our church will not be as populated as it used to be. And I know many people have a yearning for us just to go back to how it was, but I can't do that. I can't make us all younger, and I can't bring back those who have gone. Things are different, and it really is a case of how do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So let's start from the basics. What is our worship for? What is it that we do on Sunday mornings and what is it for? Well, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Jesus told us to break bread in remembrance of him. So we ought to do that. And I don't think that will ever change uh, in my sort of sensibilities. But what, aside from that, is worship? Katie's father's funeral was this week and it was an orthodox service and to my uh, understanding of worship it was it was odd uh, it was almost 40 minutes of just watching a priest say his private prayers no congregational interaction and of course in an orthodox church that's how it is the service goes on and people wander about lighting candles praying to icons they rarely stay for the whole service. They pray, they move, they do their prayers as the priest does his prayers. And whilst that wouldn't work for me because it's not my culture, there is something in there which I think we have forgotten, which is that worship isn't an audience. It isn't about what we get out of it. It isn't about what we learn from it. Worship in its purest sense, is a contraction of the old English word, worth-ship. It's where we denote worth. It's where we show God we value him. In the Bible, the, most, the, the word that's most commonly translated worship is proskuneo, which means to prostrate, to bow down. Worship is where we bow down before the Almighty. The primary thing we are supposed to do on Sunday is to give something to God. Us, individually and communally, we give something to God. Liturgy literally means the work of the people. What we do on Sunday is tribute, offering, sacrifice. Worship is work and it should be hard work. We should be tired from all the praying that we do on a Sunday morning. We should be concentrating on giving our gift to God. Now, in the Anglican Church, worship has become something about what we receive, whether we love the music or the hymns or the style of worship or whether the sermons are inspiring. And people tend to choose churches based on whether they feel moved or feel inspired or you know, what they get out of it. And that's all very important. It's important that we're all fed. But sometimes we become so focused on that that we lose the primary function, which is not to give, but which is to give, not to receive. So whether you like a certain style of worship or not is a bit like saying, a bit like saying, I'm not going to her birthday party because I don't get any presents. The question around worship is whether it frees you up to offer your gift to God. Worship is when we are in giving mode. And this is my job as a liturgist to try and shape a service that enables a congregation to offer their gifts. And crucially, we have to do that together. Again, imagine someone is having a special celebration, a wedding anniversary or a birthday or something. It's good to give them a gift, but it's better to join in the public celebration. There's something important about gathering together. And indeed, Jesus said it was important that, so important that when two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. Not one, two or three. That is so ingrained in our worship that priests can't say the Eucharist by themselves. There needs to be at least one other person to celebrate the Eucharist. Worshipping together is vitally important for the people of God because we need each other. We have seen that this year. Now in the Anglican Church there has always been an element of teaching. 
That's not a, a, a traditional part of worship, but it does have value. But where we really get ourselves into the mess is the second priority for worship, which is evangelism. The worship of the church should be in itself an act of evangelism, an act of drawing people closer to Christ. And we get into trouble with this because we confuse evangelism with entertainment. Worship shouldn't be entertainment. It should not be boring. Boredom does not in any way enable me to make my offering of sacrifice of praise to God. But when we start worrying about it being entertaining, we make a lot of mistakes in liturgy. It happens in church after church. People think we need to get more people into the church, so they change the hymns. And astonishingly, nobody new comes to church because they didn't know the old hymns and they don't know the new ones. And nobody's invited them anyway, so they wouldn't know. So all that happens is the folk who are still exactly the same folk who were there in church before they changed the hymns get fed up because they don't have their favourite hymns and they resent the new people who haven't come anyway despite the fact that they've changed the hymns. The meaning of the idea that an act of worship is evangelism means that our act of worship, the process of us offering our sacrifice to God, draws people in. When we give our whole selves to God in worship, that is the evangelism, not the hymns, not the music, not the prayers. Our action of worship is evangelism. So when I'm thinking about the liturgy of the church, the words, the shape of the, of the service, my whole thought is, what will free up the congregation? What will enable them to offer themselves wholly to God? What will enable them to bring their whole selves up to the altar, all that they are? What will enable that internal attitude, which is the source of our worship? So let's talk a bit about the words. What will be different? What might be different on Sundays? Well, as I said, liturgy is the work of the people. So the words belong to the congregation. And so the congregation have to be involved in, in shaping the liturgy over time. And that means you have to speak to me about it. You have to talk to me about it. You have to share your thoughts with me and others about it because it is our work. Uh, but we may try many things which are both new and old, and we will see what works and what doesn't. And the criteria for that is, does it free you up? Does it free you up to offer yourselves to God? And it won't be scary change quickly because there's no point in that. And like I said, the liturgy belongs to all of us. But what I can guarantee today is this, some fundamental guiding principles. Firstly, in our worship, we should use the talents of everybody who wishes to offer them. We all have different gifts. Each of us, we have different types and styles of gift. And we should embrace them all because we are called to worship together, which is to work together in acknowledging that God is our creator and giver. If we do not allow the gifts of God's people to be brought to the altar, we are not enabling worship. And too often in churches, uh, people's gifts are ignored because they haven't been there long enough or it doesn't fit the liturgy or it doesn't, you know, sort of chime in with what the, the priest wants. We have to enable everybody to offer themselves to God in worship. Secondly, worship is a communal act. We should all be invested into it. It should matter to all of us. And I want to know what you have to say but don't make it about what you like or what you don't like. Ask yourself the deeper questions. Does this worship enable me to present my gifts to God? Does it enable others to do so too? And thirdly, and perhaps this is the most important part, worship has to be the best that we have to offer. God deserves no less than our best. We have to give of our best whether we are praying in the pews, whether we are reading or intercessing or preaching or playing the organ or singing our hearts out, whether we are preparing the altar or serving at it, whether we're welcoming people into the church or cleaning the church to keep it safe for people, whether we're keeping the slates on the roof or cutting the grass, 
If it's done with the right attitude, these are acts of worship and we should give nothing but the best to God. Our standards should be high because God has given everything to us, everything. God gives us his true self on the altar every week and that is why we should do the same. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as we survey the world today, the promise of your kingdom seems especially distant. Hear our prayers, Lord, and restore in us that faith in eternity held out in Scripture. We pray for the people of Haiti, victims of a double disaster, and for the people of Afghanistan, fearful of the future under the Taliban and prepared even to risk death to escape their native land. We think especially of the women facing a restrictive and exploited life in the confines of their own homes. We pray too for the relatives of the British military personnel who lost their lives in Afghanistan and who now question whether the sacrifice was worth it. Closer to home, we pray for the friends, neighbours, and relations of the victims of the Plymouth shootings and for all those whose sense of despair and mental distress might lead them to contemplate similar action. 
May they find peace and solace. As the young return to schools and universities, let us pray that the lessons learned from the COVID epidemic be applied effectively to ensure for them as normal an educational experience as possible. With the approach of COP26 Climate Conference in Glasgow, let us pray for wisdom amongst the world's statesmen and the adoption of practical and affordable measures to slow the pace of global warming and to ensure a positive environmental legacy for future generations. We ask your blessing, Lord, on the sick of our congregation here at Holy Trinity. For Amanda, Les Chamberlain, June Donnelly, Ruth Innes, Margaret Peterson and Steve. We pray too for those in long-term care, Trudy, Rose and Diana. And we remember the lives of Harris MacDonald and Bill Burrell and pray for the souls of Angus Collins and Tony Clements, recently deceased. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We meet in Christ's name. Let us share his peace. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Worship and praise belong to you, almighty God, in every place and at all times. All power is yours. You created the heavens and established the earth. You sustain in being all that is. In Christ our Son, our life and yours are brought together in a wonderful exchange. He made his home among us, that we might forever dwell in you. Through your Holy Spirit, you call us to new birth in a creation restored by love. As children of your redeeming purpose, we offer you our praise. With angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending glory.
Glory and thanksgiving be to you, most loving Creator, for the gift of your Son born in human flesh. He is the Word existing beyond time, both source and final purpose, bringing to wholeness all that is made. Obedient to your will, he died upon the cross. By your power, you raised him from the dead. He broke the bonds of evil and set your people free to be his body in the world. On the night when he was given up to death, knowing that his hour had come, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. At supper with his disciples, he took bread and offered you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body. It is broken for you. After supper, he took the cup. He offered you thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all, that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. We now obey your son's commandment. We recall his blessed passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Made one with him, we offer you these gifts, and with them ourselves, a single, holy, living sacrifice. Hear us, most merciful God, and send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that overshadowed by his life-giving power, they may be the body and blood of your Son, and we may be kindled with the fire of your love and renewed for the service of your kingdom. Help us, who are baptized into the fellowship of Christ's body, to live and work to your praise and glory. May we grow together in unity and love, until at last, in your new creation, we enter into our heritage, in the company of the Virgin Mary, the apostles and prophets, and of all our brothers and sisters, living and departed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be to you, Lord of all ages, world without end. Amen. The living bread is broken for the life of the world. Lord, unite us in this sign. As our Saviour Christ has commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Mm.
Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to share in his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Let us give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious, and his mercy endures forever. Father, your steadfast purpose is the completion of all things in your Son. May we who have received the pledges of the kingdom live by faith, walk in hope, and be renewed in love until the world reflects your glory and you are all in all. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and those for whom we pray now and always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.